Hi everyone, Frank Spangler here for Learning Media Skills and today we're going to talk about some tips that you can use to get really good interviews. Let's get started. Now if you are brand new to filming, the first time that you set up your camera to do an interview, you might be asking yourself, now just how should I set up my interviewee. How should I have him sit? Should I set it up so that he's talking directly into the lens of the camera? Or should I position him in such a way that he's speaking just off camera? Because I've seen both. I've seen where people are looking directly into the camera and then I've seen a lot of video documentaries where the person is just talking off camera. What should I do? So as you are deciding which you would prefer, here's a couple of things to keep in mind. Some general principles as to which style is most effective for any given situation. And there are some general rules of thumb to follow when you're uh, deciding whether or not to have the person looking directly on camera, we call it, or looking off camera. Generally speaking, when your speaker is a, an authority figure in the field of the documentary that you're doing, perhaps they're a TV host for a series of documentaries that you're doing, generally speaking, they will look directly into the camera as they introduce the documentary as they pop into the documentary from time to time and then to uh, close off the video at the end. They're leading the viewer on a journey through the discovery of the subject that they're talking about. And they want to be able to connect very directly with the viewing audience as they do this. And so it's a good idea for that situation for the person to be looking directly into the lens of the camera. As a general principle, whenever you want the person that you're filming to be speaking directly to your viewing audience, that's when you should have them on camera. When you are interviewing somebody who needs to tell a story then it usually works better if they're looking off camera and they're telling their story to a third person and the viewer is just kind of listening in to the conversation that two other people are having and it's not quite so intense as it is when someone's looking directly into the lens of the camera and so it, it's one step back if the people that are telling the story are just looking off camera, telling it to a third person. And that usually works better. Usually a uh, general rule of thumb is that if it is a film documentary, the person will be looking off camera. If it's a TV news report, the person will be looking on camera. If it is an organization that's raising money, the president of that organization might come on at the very end and give an emotional appeal to their supporters. In that case, it's a good idea to have him looking directly into the lens of the camera rather than off camera. To have your emotional appeal at the end of your video, to have the president looking off camera, he's not going to be connecting with the audience as effectively as if he's looking right into the lens of the camera. So that will give you a general idea of when to have the person looking directly into the lens and when to have them looking off camera. The next thing that we should cover is how to position your interviewee. And that will depend on which style you are following. If you are doing the interview where the speaker is looking directly into the lens of the camera, a general rule is to have them just centered right in your shot. Frame up your shot so that the person is right in the middle of the video. If you are having them look off camera, 
then it's a good idea to just move them over a little bit and have them turn slightly, turn their shoulders slightly so that they are looking at the person who is asking the questions. And by the way, if you are having uh, this off-camera style, you really need, or at least you almost always have to have a person who's assisting you, someone who's asking the questions. In order to get an effective interview, you have to have someone sitting right beside the camera that the person can have eye contact with. And it's quite important that whoever you choose to be that person who has the point of focus to have a little bit of training on how to conduct an interview, how to ask the questions, how to draw out the answers, how to listen uh, with your body, you know, you're nodding your head and you're showing empathy and you're, you're drawing out the, the answers from the person who's being interviewed. And by the way, we do have a good video on that that if you haven't seen yet, you should really take a look at before you go out and do the, your first interview. It's called The Art of the Interview and it's all about how to ask good questions, how to uh, have that eye contact with the person that you're interviewing and, and be engaging and just being able to draw out those uh, answers that you need for your video. If your person doesn't know how to do that, there's a good chance you won't get a very good interview. It's very important that whoever you choose to assist you in this task, uh, be aware of how they need to listen very um, with their body and you know nodding their head and showing empathy and oh you know because if you don't have that the person will just give very dry answers and if the person's not giving eye contact they're going to be looking around and and giving answers that aren't that interesting or effective so if you know that you are going to be working with someone who is going to be your helper a lot they should take a look at this video as well i'll put a link in the description below as to how you can watch that video it's really important if you find yourself out in the field and you just have to recruit somebody take five minutes and explain to them how important it is that they listen with their body you know they're nodding their head they're keeping that eye contact and and just drawing out the answers so important so the person is just turned just a little bit with their body and by the way I'm sitting on a chair that <coughs> rotates <laughs> and it's a good idea not to have your interview e on one of those chairs because they will rock back and forth if, if it's a rocking chair you'll find them doing this and that can be very distracting uh, or if it's a swivel chair you know they're going to be going like this while they answer People get nervous when they're on camera and they do this without really realizing it. And you can tell them, oh, by the way, can you just not uh, move? And two minutes later, they're doing this again. So good idea is to set them down on a chair that doesn't move. All right, so we have them looking off camera. A couple of other tips on this. The person who's helping you do the questionings needs to be sitting very close to the camera. A lot of times I'll find my helper sitting too far away from the camera. Somehow they, they don't want to be too close to the camera. But what that happens is the interviewee then is looking this, something like this when they answer the questions. And it's just too far off camera. You're getting too much of a profile that way. And it can be confusing to the person who's watching the video. They they wonder, well, why are they looking off into the distance? And a lot of times the person who's being interviewed, again, because they're nervous, will tend to, to look around as they're thinking of what to say next. And so if your person's already sitting there, they could be looking almost like this as they're thinking of what to say next. And so the closer that you can have them to your camera, the better. Right up against the camera, I like to have them. Now, if you are just doing one interview for your story, I usually do that interview where the, the, my 
uh, helper is sitting to the what would be the right of me and the person is turns his shoulders just kind of to the left. Um, the, I feel that's the most natural. However, if you are interviewing maybe six people for your documentary, it's a good idea to do three of the people on one side and then swap it out. And by the way, we're following the rules of thirds here. When the person's looking off camera, the shoulders are turned just a little bit, and you'll notice that the eyes are coming right on the top line of third, and the person is coming on the vertical line of thirds. Whether they're on the left or on the right, their, their, their body is coming down on that other line of thirds. So we're following the rule of thirds when we do it this way. So some of your interviews will be looking on this side of the camera, some will be looking on the other side of the camera. And the reason we like that is because when we go to edit the video, we'll have some of both. Some on this side of the camera, some on the other side of the camera. And the reason that's important is because we don't usually like to cut or dissolve one face right on top of the other. And if we have half the interviews looking this way and half of the interviews where the person's looking this way, when we do a dissolve, one interview over another, or even a cut, we don't have one person's face all of a sudden morphing in to uh, another face. Now, you might be wondering, what do I do if I don't have someone there to help me ask the questions? Should I do that interview where the person's just looking directly in, into the lens of the camera and I can just kind of pop my head up and ask the next question and then the person can be looking directly into the lens of the camera? Well, I suppose that would be one solution. But if you're doing a film documentary and you have four people looking off camera and then all of a sudden two interviews where the, person, the people are looking directly into the camera, it's going to seem a little weird. And uh, so I would recommend doing what you can to find a helper, train them real quick, so that they at least have someone to uh, have that eye contact with. But let's say that you just don't have anybody that can help you, and you are out there on your own. You are a one-man band or one girl band. Well, it's not totally impossible. And uh, this works with the 90D camera uh, because it has this flip out articulating screen that I can turn and keep a close eye on while I'm uh, asking the questions um, to the interviewee. I can every once in a while just check the screen to make sure everything is going okay. I'm, otherwise, I'm just keeping that eye contact and uh, listening with my body, nodding my head, encouraging them, showing my empathy and understanding to what they've gone through. And uh, every once in a while, I just check the screen to make sure everything's still rolling. I've got my headphones on, and that's very important, by the way, when you're running camera. Uh, to be uh, monitoring the audio, these cameras have a headphone out and uh, so it's always a good idea. I don't think I have my headphones right handy to put them on. But when you are filming, you really need to be listening to the audio to make sure you're not getting any wind noise or you're not getting any interference. If you've got a wireless system, uh, even a wired mic, uh, if it's... Uh, not the best cable can cause interference. So you need to make sure that you're getting nice clean audio and the only way you can do that is to monitor your audio. So I'm monitoring the audio, I'm checking the screen every once in a while to make sure everything is still framed properly and it's still rolling. And, uh, but for the most part I'm looking and I'm acting like the, the very intentional listener uh, that uh, helps to draw out the good answers. Now, the thing that you need to know about doing this is that you have to let the person know ahead of time that every once in a while you're going to be checking the camera to make sure that everything is okay. 
but what you want them to do is to continue talking just as if I was still here listening to every word that you say. So whenever I turn to look at the camera, just keep talking as though you were looking straight at my eyes um, because all I'm doing is just checking to make sure everything is okay. If you don't do that, what's going to happen is the first time you go to check your camera, the people are going to stop. Right in the middle of their answer, they're just going to stop. Because they think, oh, something went wrong with the camera. I might as well stop. He's checking. It's something, he's looking at the camera. Something must have gone wrong. And they stop their answer. So, But if you let them know ahead of time, I'm sorry I don't have my assistant with me today. We're going to have to do this interview, just, just the two of us. Uh, I just want you to forget the camera's even here. We're just having a nice conversation. And uh, just, by the way, every once in a while I'm going to have to check to make sure the camera's rolling okay. But I want you to just keep, keep talking as though I was still watching you. Is that, is that okay? And, uh, and then you'll be fine. Now, we should say a few things about audio. Uh, and we do have another video lesson on audio for filming that is a good idea. If you haven't watched that, you really should watch that as well because audio is critical when it comes to doing an interview. If you're using a wireless system like I have here today, you need to make sure that the volume coming out of the transmitter isn't coming off too hot. Because while you can adjust the manual settings of the audio coming into the 90D camera or most cameras, it might be too hot right from the source. And so if you've got a good wireless system, you can be, uh, it should have little meters going up and down here, and you can tell right away if you're redlining right at the source. And that's important. Um, your receiver might have manual adjustments on it as well. And you might be coming too hot, coming in too hot on the receiver, even before it gets to the camera. And so it's important to um, be aware of that problem and uh, be ready to fix it before you start your interview. Make sure that you've got good levels here. Uh, if you're not using a wireless system, let's say you've got uh, an audio assistant, that's the, the best uh, way to do it, holding a boom mic, we've got one here, maybe um, your audio guy even has this on a pole, a boom pole, and he's holding it just above the person's mouth, out of the shot, out of the shot, but um, picking up, is, it's actually, the mic is very close to your speaker. And that, I would say, is the most ideal. If you're doing a serious film documentary, it looks a little odd to have the person have a mic on them. Now, if it's a TV program and uh, people are sitting around a desk, it seems quite common to have the lapel mic showing in the shot. But for serious film documentaries, uh, a lot of film producers don't want to see this mic showing in the shot. So they'll either try and hide the mic uh, somewhere under the clothes or they'll use an audio person with a boom mic uh, and just keep it up out of the shot. Most TV programs uh, or movies do it this way where the boom mic, there's a, that's, there's a guy that's, that's just their job is to hold the mic just out of the shot. And uh, if you have somebody that can help you do that and you can afford a mic like this, that is the best solution. However, for those who may not have the budget to spend a thousand dollars on some type of miking solution, here's, here's what I would recommend. Uh, is getting an onboard microphone like this. I like this Rode mic. I think it's called the Rode Plus Pro or Rode Pro Plus, something like that. I'll put the uh, information for this mic below. I found it to be very good. And it serves two purposes. It helps me get great ambient audio as I'm getting those walk around shots. Because if you just rely on the little microphone here, um, it's, 
you're going to be very disappointed. You're going to get back and start to, to edit the video and it's just going to be a lot of wind noise. <laughs> because it's very sensitive to the wind. You need an onboard microphone just for your walk around shots. But when it comes time to interview, uh, this can be your interview mic as well. It's a very directional, almost boom mic. So for those times where I'm out there and I don't have an assistant that can help me with a, a boom mic on a fish pole, and I'm working with this type of solution, and I'm about to do an interview, what I will often do is take the mic right off the camera, and I've got my assistant over here asking the questions, but I'm, I'm holding the mic and I've got headphones on to make sure that I'm not picking up any scratching noises while I handle the mic. Got to, as, by the way, if you do have somebody, uh, an assistant who's not trained, they will often not understand how important it is to hold that boom mic very carefully if they're hand holding it. Oftentimes they'll be thinking and, and not maybe even paying attention too much to what they're doing and they're making all sorts of uh, hand noises as they rub up against the boom mic. And so another good reason why you have to have the headphones on to catch that type of thing and let your assistant know that they have to hold it very carefully. It's another good reason why to have your boom mic on a fish pole. It uh, prevents the possibility that your assistant is going to touch the mic at any point or play with the cord and make all sorts of noise that interferes with your interview. But here I am, I'm holding it and I've got my headphones on so I know that I, I'm getting a nice clean interview. And this works if you've got your camera quite close to the person who's, who you're talking to. So I've just got it quite close, it's out of the shot. It doesn't look like it's out of the shot right now because you're looking at it from a different camera but I can tell by my screen that it's out of the shot, but I'm still picking up good audio. And uh, the advantage to this too is that if your helper is acting as your translator as well, which is often the case when I go film, I'm filming in remote villages in Africa somewhere, and the people are speaking their own ethnic minority language, and uh, so I have to have a translator and then what I can do is just swing this mic around and pick up the translator uh, giving his uh, translation of the story. And then I bring it back for the next question. So this mic can, can act as double duty for you. It can be your great ambient audio recorder as well as getting good interviews. Now if you do have an assistant to help you, and you don't have uh, the money for a nice boom mic, this is the only thing that you have, here's a little trick that you can do, is pick up an audio extension cable for your mic. So having this audio cable now, you can get your camera back further, and that can be very helpful. A lot of times when the camera lens is is too close to the person that you're interviewing, they can be more nervous. If you're back a little ways, kind of maybe under the shadow of the tree behind you, uh, and your, your helper is sitting closer to the person being interviewed, but still out of your shot, it becomes more of a situation where they're just having a nice conversation with your friend, your helper, your assistant, and they can forget about me and the camera because I'm, I'm back quite a ways. You know, you've got your audio guy, he's got his mic on a bamboo pole just right above the mouth of the person but still out of the shot, and yet you can be back quite a ways. And again, it's good to ha have your headphones on if you're using this extension cable because, you know, these are not professional cables, and if it's not plugged in carefully uh, and making a good connection, you can get some static. Um, and so be sure to always monitor your uh, audio. 
All right, well, before we close, there's just a couple of other things I want to share with you. First of all, I want to emphasize how important it is to schedule enough time with your family or the person that you're interviewing to get what we call B-roll shots. And if you're brand new to filmmaking, you might wonder, well, what on earth is B-roll shots? And why do they call it B-roll shots? Today, a better term would probably be illustrative cover. In other words, when you do the interview, they're going to be talking about their life and about their situation. And in addition to the talking head, you want to get some wonderful shots that illustrate the things that they have just said. You want to schedule about twice as much time getting the B-roll shots as you schedule for getting the interview. And when you think that you've gotten enough B-roll, get some more. <laughs> and you probably won't understand the reason why or how important this is until you become a video editor yourself. I can't tell you how many times I've been halfway through a video edit project and I'm out of shots. I've got nothing to work with. I've used all of the shots that are, are provided and I'm stuck. And you probably know yourself. If you've turned on a, a video program or found a YouTube video that's just somebody talking, talking head, talking head, talking head, well, you soon get very bored and you're off to the next video. The B-roll shots, the illustrative cover, is what keeps the interest of your viewer. A general rule of thumb is when you're editing a video that every three or four seconds you're changing your shot to keep up that interest. And so let's say it's a 10 minute documentary. I would estimate 80% is cover, illustrative cover, 20% interview. You know, I, I have worked with several clients over the years and uh, the first time we go out, they'll often schedule maybe eight interviews for the day. You know, one an hour. Shouldn't be a problem, right? Well, the problem is, at the end of the day, I've got cards full of talking heads, but nothing to cover or illustrate the things that they are saying. And so when I go to do the edit, yeah, yeah, I am stuck. And so I have to let my clients know that for every hour of interview that you schedule, you need to schedule in at least two hours more for getting the illustrative cover. Why are they called B-roll shots? Well, that goes back to the day when we used to film our documentaries with actual videotape. And then we'd take those tapes back to our studio and we'd be using video tape players, two of them, an A deck and a B deck. And, a, an, and then a third deck would be our record deck. And so we'd have all of our interviews on one tape in the A deck and all of the illustrative cover shots would be in the B deck. And we had a, a little controller that controlled the play decks and the record decks. And you could set up an edit where you're getting part of the interview. And then it switches to the B deck to get that illustrative B roll. And just so you know, it's more than just having illustrative shots to make your video more interesting. It's also there to cover up the edits that we have to make in the interview. I suppose that's why they call it cover. We're covering a jump cut. And how this works is you've got your person being interviewed and they're talking along, but they have a lot of ums and ahs and they're thinking and uh, you aren't going to obviously use all of that material. You're going to use the best statements, the most interesting statements that tell the story. And uh, so you, you're taking that interview and you're cutting it up. And what happens when you make a, an edit is the person might be talking along this way, but when you go to edit the next shot, his head might be over here. And so what happens if you just watch uh, a video that's 
just talking head and it's all cut up, all edited, then their, their head's going to be jumping around all over the place. It's actually something that's becoming more allowable and permissible, more normal because of YouTube and all of the YouTube creators that don't want to take the time to cover the jump cuts. And so it is becoming more common these days. But back in the day when I started, you never wanted to see a, a jump cut in the middle of a video interview. It's another reason why we want the cover, the illustrative cover, is to cover up those edits and avoid the, the jumping head. Now, you may have noticed some news reporters where all of a sudden you're seeing the guy's hands, just a close-up of the person's hands, like that. And that's what that's all about. The, the news camera guy knows that his editor is going to want to have some kind of footage to cover up the jump shots, the jump cuts. But they're really, they don't have a lot of time, they need to get on to the next story. And so instead of scheduling in a couple of hours to get nice illustrative shots about the news story, when they're doing the interview, after the interview's over, they'll say, now I just need to get a couple shots, uh, close-up shots of your hands uh, or something else. Uh, and uh, that's what the editor ends up having to use to cover the shot. I'm not telling you that because I want you to get some close-up shots of the hands. <laughs> I'm just saying if you ever wondered why all of a sudden in a news report you see somebody's hands close up, it's covering a jump cut. What I want you to do is go out and get lots of interesting cover shots to cover those jump cuts. Now, one last thing that I want to talk about before we close today, and that is answering the question, how much of the person should I have in the shot? And do I ever zoom in? I guess my answer would be, if you're filming in 4K, like we've recommended, then the person who edits the video can always digitally zoom in and not lose any quality. And that way, if the person that you're interviewing starts to say something that is very emotional, and they might be you know, starting to shed a little tear, if your editor has that 4K video, you know, the editor can crop in and get the close-up shot without you having to zoom in the camera. If you want to zoom in, like when you start your interview, it's a good idea to get a, a fairly wide shot. Remember, you want to be kind of following those rule of thirds where you've got the person over on one side and they've turned their shoulders a little bit. And you can start with a shot something like this. But then maybe somewhere along the way, you might zoom in for a tighter shot. That'll be fine. Just make sure that you're allowing enough headroom at the top and that your eyes are still kind of going through that imaginary line of thirds at the top of your video. But if you're shooting 4K, you can set it and forget it. And the editor, at his own option, will be able to do that uh, cut in closer. In fact, they can digitally zoom. If they're skilled enough at editing, they can take that establishing shot and slowly zoom in to a tighter shot, all digitally in the computer itself. So leave the zoom to the editor if you're filming in 4K and you know the project is going to be edited in HD. If you're doing a lot of interviews and you keep your camera set on 4K, you might find that your card fills up very fast and your hard drives fill up very fast, especially you know, if you're working with a, a translator who has to translate and, and your half hour video turns into an hour long video. If you keep your camera rolling that long at 4K, well, it's going to fill up. Even if you have a 256 gig uh, card, you're going to find that your card uh, is full of interviews very fast. So you may want to consider um, when you're doing a long interview, there's a couple things you can do to save on your hard, hard drive space. 
and your card space. Number one is to, to switch it to HD. And I think we showed you how to do that in, a, in another lesson. Switch it to HD while you're doing your interviews. And when you do that, just remember that after you have the first few minutes of the interview where the person is framed, like from about here up, then you maybe want to get a little closer or zoom in a little bit so that you're getting the person kind of from here up and allowing enough headroom at the top. Now there's another solution. If you watch that video on the art of the interview, I have uh, told you about a device that's good to have. I know it's another $500, but it's really a recording studio in a box. I mean, you know, you've got four professional XLR ins, you've got two mics here, you've got separate volume controls for each mic. Uh, I mean, it's just an amazing device. I've recorded podcasts in the field with this. And uh, so you might find other uses for it and justify the budget for getting one of these. But if you have this, if you can get your hands on one of these, when you're doing an interview, you can set your mic into the device, be recording to a separate card, and keep this rolling for the full hour uh, where you're getting the, the statements, the translation, and in the end, after your day is over, you can send the audio file to your translator and they can give you a complete transcription of the statements that will help us back in Canada um, be able to, you know, have a complete understanding of the story. When I'm interviewing, I tell my translator just to give me the gist of what they said. Don't give me the whole answer. I just summarize what they said so that I know how to ask the next question. I want just enough information on the spot to know how I should do my follow-up questions. But I want the full story later. So having it on, on recording on this device, I can, when I get back to the hotel, I can easily you know, save the audio file to an MP3, send it to my translator, and ask them to give me a full transcription and translation of the interview so that uh, as we look at that back home, uh, we've got the full, complete story with no gaps. The advantage to this is that you can have an output, you know, there's uh, the headphone output of this device, you can just put that cable in and put the other end of the cable into the microphone so that you've got a professional mic coming into this device and headphone audio going into the uh, recording device of the camera. And that way, every time the person is finished his statement, you can press pause or stop the video from recording. And then when it comes time to the next question, your helper asks the question and you press record again. And even if you're shooting 4K video, it's not going to fill up your card because you're just capturing the answers, not the questions, not the uh, translation on the spot. So if you can at all possible, get a hold of one of these. All right, well, I believe that does it for today's lesson on tips on how to film good interviews. I hope that you found it helpful. If you had questions that I didn't answer, by all means, put them in the comments below and uh, we'll get to those. If you found the video helpful, please, by all means, give us a like. That always helps our channel here. Share with a friend. And if you haven't yet done so, I invite you to subscribe to our channel where we'll be uh, producing a lot more videos like this to help you out in your new film career. Frank Spangler for learning media skills. So long for now.